Welcome back to Recalibrate, a Samsung podcast. I'm your host, Timothy Day, and we've got another great conversation lined up for you today. Along with the essential utilities we think of, water, gas, and electricity, there's another one that has entered our lives, and that's broadband internet access. The internet has long been used for entertainment and shopping, but the current pandemic has heightened its importance in our lives. Many more of us work from home. We skip the movie theater for our living rooms, and we grocery shop in front of a screen. And while fiber continues to be installed and speeds have increased from megabits per second to gigabit rates for many of us, there are still many people who can't easily get online regularly. On one side of the digital divide are those with easy and always-on high-speed access. On the other, those who must go to a certain place or wait for a certain time to be online, or never have had the opportunity. With me today is John Godfrey, Senior Vice President of Public Policy at Samsung, to help us understand why the digital divide exists, who is affected by it, and what is being done to bridge this space. John, welcome to Recalibrate. Thank you, Timothy. It's uh, nice to talk to you. I'm glad to be here. Let's begin with discussing broadband internet access. Why is it important? Well, uh, uh, here after one year of COVID-related pandemic, uh, quarantining and work shuts down, shutdowns, I think probably everybody has a whole new appreciation for how essential uh, internet access is. It's really a must-have for Americans today. And there are some of us uh, who have been fine uh, with their broadband access over the last year, but there are many Americans who are facing serious challenges. No working from home. You know, if your job can't be done through broadband, it's be, it's been very hard for the last year to do that work. Or job hunting online. Most job hunting is done electronically now. For kids, no virtual school. Uh, for healthcare. No virtual doctor appointments if you don't have internet access or if you have inadequate internet access that is not equal to video streaming. Um, shopping, you know, we've all learned, I think, to uh, to order takeout and order groceries to be delivered and, and clothes and other essentials. That's not a luxury. That you, you have to have those things. And if you don't have internet access and you are forced to to go to the store in person to buy those things, that's an extra health risk when the uh, when you're in a pandemic situation. Entertainment obviously has been important over the last year. People are binge watching shows online and catching up on classic movies and entertainment's important. But I, I think one that has hit a lot of people especially hard is social isolation. Uh, we all can't wait to get back in touch with our, our friends and family in person. But in the meantime, having virtual visits with your friends and family is way better than no contact at all. And people without internet access or with low quality, uh, poor quality internet access are more likely to be socially isolated right now. So if you, you know, uh, if you don't have the internet, you miss out on all of those things. And even after the pandemic is over, those things are going to continue to be important. But th this last year has really underlined the importance for us all. I couldn't agree more, John. Tell us, uh, what impacts do you think all of this will have? Uh, well, I think, you know, two great examples of the impact of, of the digital divide are in education and work. Uh, those of us who have kids at home who are trying to do school. Uh, during a pandemic are, are, are challenged, but even when we get back into regular school, kids are going to need to do their homework and their group projects through the internet that's going to stay online um, even after the emergency ends. And the kids who are, are forced to drive to a, you know, to a McDonald's parking lot to get Wi-Fi access and do their homework in their parents' car are at a real disadvantage in learning. That's that's often called the homework gap. Can we dig into that homework gap a little bit, John? Is that an issue that was created by the pandemic, or is it one that's just been exacerbated by it? 
Uh, I would say exacerbated. Yeah, it, it predates the pandemic. The, there is a, a lot of data on this. Uh, one example, there's a national nonprofit called Education Superhighway that estimated recently that 9.7 million students, half of whom are students of color, don't have a reliable high-speed connection necessary to complete their coursework at home. So uh, those kids are, you know, especially now uh, in danger of falling behind. But even when school is back in person, uh, they will, you know, and, and have been in the past disadvantaged. And, and then it's not only an education issue, but, you know, as I mentioned, also a work issue, being able to do your jobs online or finding a new job online. Um, the Pew Research Center did a survey uh, that found that a majority of U.S. adults have gone online to look for job information and job leads, and 45% have applied for a job online. That was before the pandemic. During the pandemic, pretty much all job hunting has had to be uh, online. So granted, the internet does play a more vital role in our lives these days, but most people do have broadband internet access. Can you tell us who exactly is affected by this digital divide? There are a lot of different measures, and some of them are kind of controversial. But uh, I'll start with the, you know, the U.S. government agency uh, responsible for broadband and telecommunications. That's the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC. They have for many years tracked the deployment of broadband in America and uh, the, the availability of it. And they define broadband as 25 megabits per second download speed, three megabits per second upload speed, which some people consider to be a pretty minimal level of broadband, especially if you're going to be doing video conferencing for work or school. But, but let's stick with that definition of 25 down and three up. Uh, by that definition, the FCC estimates that about 14 and a half million Americans lack access to broadband where they live, so that even if they want broadband, it's just not available uh, in the place where they live. And a lot of that is people in rural areas. Um, that's the FCC's estimate, but the problem is actually probably larger than that. Can you expand on those differences for us, John? You know, there have been independent reviews done. Uh, one by a group called Broadband Now, but I, I've seen several that have identified a challenge in the way the FCC measures the availability of broadband. Um, the It has to do with the granularity of the data collection. If there is uh, reported data that a certain area has broadband service, maybe not actually if every single person in that area has access. They may report the entire area as having broadband available when, when only some of the people have access. And so a more granular study by this group Broadband Now estimates that the actual population who do not have internet available at their home address may be over twice as large as what the FCC estimated. But uh, at, you know, availability and access where you live is is only one of the causes of the di the digital divide. The other um, is related to people who have access to broadband that are not choosing to subscribe where they live. And that could be because it costs too much; uh, they just can't afford it, or it may be that they're intimidated or unready to go online. They're not, you know, comfortable setting up a Wi-Fi router at their house or or using a uh, a computer, uh, especially older populations, that may be the case. Or there may be people, people who, you know, just don't want to be online. And, and that's fine. That's, that's their right. The, you know, the U.S. Census Bureau does regular surveys uh, of households asking if they have broadband, what kind of broadband they have. And their most recent community survey data shows that more than 36 million households in the United States, which is about one third of all the households in the United States, do not subscribe to a home broadband connection. That's about a third of households do not have a home broadband connection. Uh, 
some of those people have a cell phone and so they can get on the internet through their cell phone but that's uh that's a a, a more limited experience than having full blown broadband at your house and unlike the availability issue that I talked about earlier uh, uh this data uh, actually has found that that people signing up for broadband, m many more of the houses that are not signed up for broadband are in urban areas rather than, than in rural areas. So this is not just a rural urban divide. This is uh, really broader than that. That one third of households number is really surprising, John. So this did we have this digital divide. It affects all kinds of people in all kinds of places across the spectrum. What can be done to bridge this gap? The availability issue is really about laying broadband uh, infrastructure into rural areas where the population density is, is sparse. And so the return on investment of laying fiber and cable can be prohibitively expensive because it costs a lot to, to run those wires. One of the solutions to that may be wireless, which uh, uh, which I can tell you a bit more about since that's something Samsung does a lot in. But uh, the, the FCC last year launched something called the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund, which is set to spend more than $20 billion over the next 10 years using universal service funding to help close the rural digital divide. And they also launched the 5G fund for rural America, which could spend another $9 billion specifically on, on mobile 5G wireless in rural areas. The president has also recently announced an infrastructure proposal, the American Jobs Plan, which would add a whole lot more money for broadband deployment if Congress passes it. Uh, the proposed amount is approaching $100 billion. So all of that could help overcome that hurdle of the high cost of deploying broadband into rural areas uh, where the, the population is low uh, and so the return is low. But uh, uh, as I said a minute ago, you know, some it's, it's not only about access to broadband, it's also about affordability, people being able to pay their monthly broadband bill or uh, being able to buy the equipment or getting technical help to use the equipment and get online successfully. So the recent COVID relief laws, there was a, a year-end 2020 spending law, and then earlier this year, uh, the American Rescue Plan were, were both passed in quick succession by Congress, and they include spending for emergency support for people to pay for their broadband, to pay for equipment. Those are, are a big help during the pandemic emergency, but they, they will expire when the emergency is over. And so more needs to be done to get those programs rolled out and quickly and also make them longer lasting. Let's circle back to that wireless piece, John. What role does wireless play in all of this? You know, one thing I uh, am certain about is that 5G uh, wireless should play a big part in solving these problems. 5G uh, is something Samsung is a leader in. It's a leap forward in wireless capability beyond 4G. Um, it you know it's will make your smartphone much faster, but it's not only for smartphones uh, and and for being built into cars. It's also something that can really help close the digital divide through affordable, rapidly deployable broadband to home. How how so, John? How does that work? 5G is capable of providing the high speed and the low network latency, the, the low lag time that you would expect from fiber, but without without wires, without fibers, it's wireless. And so you'll have a, a, a radio signal from a tower going to your home. Now the data rates will not be generally uh, quite as high as fiber would be to the home, but they are more than fast enough or the applications we've been talking about, education, employment, healthcare, uh, social interaction. The, uh, the, the wireless communication to your home is equal to that. And with wireless, a larger area can be covered without the expensive and time-consuming need to string lines to each house. So you can save a lot of upfront cost. So what we would like to see is uh, 
Congress and the FCC implement this broadband funding that I talked about, potentially even $100 billion coming from Congress, to implement it in a technology neutral way that recognizes the potential of wireless to be part of that solution. Um, you know, beyond the funding, uh, we also need the FCC to continue the good work they've been doing in recent years to continue allocating spectrum for wireless, especially in what are called the mid bands, the middle spectrum bands, uh, where they recently uh, have, have made something called CBRS spectrum and C band spectrum available, and network operators have bought licenses to that spectrum and are deploying now, uh, but we need to keep that good momentum going. And we also need local governments to continue to streamline the 5G siting process. New, there are going to need to be a lot of new cell sites deployed and minimizing the regulatory requirements for putting up that equipment on a, you know, on a light pole or the corner of a building. Uh, that's a really important step. John, that was great. Thanks so much for sharing with our listeners how we can reduce this digital divide. And to our audience, thank you for participating in today's podcast. And we look forward to seeing you next time on Recalibrate. <laughs>